Alrighty, everybody, <clears throat> we are ready to do this. <laughs> Welcome to the IBA conference. My name is Lori Roberts. I work for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And it over to our president, John Hechtel. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be able to officially open IBA's 27th international and first ever virtual conference. Conferences are such a key part of IBA's efforts to support bear professionals and disseminate knowledge. They're great opportunities to meet other bear people, develop professional relationships and make friends, and they're fun. I'd hope to be attending one in person, but the, the decision to go virtual was the right one. It's a new experience for us all, but hopefully will be a worthwhile one. The virtual format does allow people across the globe to attend and organizers adjusted schedules so members in different parts of the world can join some live sessions at a reasonable hour. People have been spending so much time interacting over screens recently that trying to estimate how many people we should plan for was difficult. Ultimately, almost 400 people registered, and that's great news. Montana hosted our third conference in Kalispell in 77 and our ninth in Missoula in 1992. Kalispell was a great choice for 2020. Montana and the Northern Rockies are a stronghold for grizzly bears in North America, and biologists there have done a tremendous amount of cutting edge, long-term bear work. It would have been great to meet in Montana again, but COVID intervened, so we're making the best of it. I can't thank the organizing and program committees enough. I want to give special thanks to Lori Roberts, Kate Smith, and Andrea Morehouse. I know having to change plans, postpone the conference, and make so many decisions without really knowing what was likely to happen was frustrating. Their dedicated committees persevered, though. This had to be one of the most challenging conference planning events in IBA history and we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Big thanks also to Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and US Fish and Wildlife Service for their conference support and giving their employees time to organize it. And I wanna thank our generous sponsors, Counter Assault, Defenders of Wildlife, MPG Ranch, Polar Bears International, University of Montana College of Forestry and Conservation, Vital Ground Foundation, Wildlife Genetics International and the Montana Chapter of the Wildlife Society. When I assumed the role of IBA president in January of 2020, no one could have predicted how much the world was about to change or how long the impacts of the virus would disrupt our lives. COVID has made both personal and professional life difficult and challenging for so many members struggling to take care of themselves and their families while working at home from on their jobs. The pandemic has been tough for organizations like IBA too, and the many groups our members work for. IBA depends mostly on volunteers and we recognized the strains they were under. We tried to adapt and change some expectations and timelines. Luckily, we also had help from our employees and contractors. We understood some people had to leave us, but amazingly, most volunteers still made time for IBA. Not everything worked out as hoped, but IBA has been able to weather the pandemic so far. The informal beginning of IBA was a workshop in Whitehorse, Yukon in 1968, and the fact that two retired bear people, Steve Ferrero and Jack Lenfer, who attended that very first workshop are still around, says a lot about how young an organization IBA really is. Our mission states that IBA advances scientific understanding and global conservation of the world's eight bear species. We're a member run nonprofit professional society pursuing its mission, not through hired staff of biologists, but rather through the work of our many members and by partnering, partnering with other organizations. I joined over 40 years ago and watched it develop from a mostly North American association to a more diverse international group working to better serve members and global bear conservation. We've slowly developed and refined our identity, structure, and operations over the years and are still improving. Our strength has always been our members, and we currently have about 513 from 49 countries. Al LeCount stated in a 1999 paper on the history of IBA, quote, I also acknowledge the commitment and sheer tenacity of the many individuals who have contributed to IBA history over the past 30 years. For many of us, a lifelong commitment to the welfare of bears worldwide has been fostered through IBA. Some of the individuals who started this organization 30 years ago are no longer with us, but many still are, and many other bright shining faces with similar commitments have appeared along the way." End quote. And Al's assessment is still true to this day. Later in the conference, our members meeting, everyone has a chance to discuss IBA in more depth, but I wanted to just mention a few things now. In addition to our conferences, there are other valuable IBA programs and services. 
IBA has published 32 volumes of scientific papers, including conference proceedings and the peer-reviewed journal Ursus. John Swenson, in his function as editor-in-chief, has modernized Ursus and made it a true publication of the 21st century. It's now a fully electronic journal with good turnover rate and immediate publication of finished papers. And Ursus is always also close to self-sustaining financially. IBA partners with the Bear Specialist Group to publish international bear news three times a year. The newsletter highlights important bear stories and the work of members of birth, both groups and provides updates on things like recent bear literature. We now have a professional graphic designer helping with layout. And since IBM has now gone almost completely digital, we're saving money and resources. The Bear Conservation Grants Fund program is now an important part of IBA. Since we first awarded grants in 1993, and thanks to the generation, generosity of the Bevins and Homer funds, as well as other donors, IBA has awarded over $1.3 million in research and conservation grants to its members for 217 projects in 40 different countries. Julia Bevins and Karen Noyce were instrumental in getting our grants program going. We've also given out over 100,000 in conference travel and experience and exchange grants. And we recently started a special grants program that gives donors more opportunities for targeted giving or for giving gifts in someone's memory. And in the first year of the program, we had 6,500 to give out for that. So it's off to a good start. There are still other areas we're working on growing and improving. Bear managers are valued members of IBA and we want to ensure IBA is useful and relevant to them. Carl Lackey and Dave Telesco are IBA management committee co-chairs and have been working to develop more programs and resources for managers. We now have conflict literature and agency manuals scanned and available on our website. And I know Carl and Dave have plans to develop the group even more. Any managers who aren't involved should contact them. IBA leadership recognizes the students of today will be the leaders of tomorrow. We've had an active student group for many years and have tried to include student activities in our conferences, for example. I wanna thank Amy McLeod and some of the others who have worked hard to engage students. But we want not only to support students, but also to use students' energy and skills to improve IBA. So students, don't be shy. We need your input and help. Various social media outlets have grown in importance, but we haven't yet taken advantage of them to spread awareness of IBA and bear conservation. But we're starting to try though. We regularly share posts about bears on Facebook, and we now have over 5,500 followers on Facebook, which is modest, but not bad. We have more to do to increase our profile and activity there and on other social networks too. And IBA also has a YouTube channel just called Bear Biology, in which we've posted some short videos by members on their projects. We have Wildlife SOS Sloth Bear Safety videos and the Safety in Bear Country series available to stream. And according to a recent YouTube update, our channel has had over 98,000 hits and people have watched almost 9,000 hours of video on there. We've done a good job over the years as an all volunteer group, but there were downsides with that as well. As IBA grew larger and more complex, we've start, struggled with continuity and record keeping as well as volunteer burnout. And no matter how good we've done, needs are so much greater than we can address. So we've tried to keep looking for opportunities to do more and do better. We started to implement our strategic plan and transition, working on IBA structure and functioning and expanding our grants program and supporting a couple of staff members. But the timing of the start of the transition just as the pandemic began was unfortunate. So we're reviewing our progress, learning from what happened and focusing how best to move forward. That will require adaptive management where we keep learning and modifying some things previously envisioned. I know we, we, we will become a stronger, better organization as we move forward. Maybe to some IBA is just a professional society, but to me and many, many of our members, it is much more. It's a global community of talented professionals, not only passionate about bears, but committed to helping and supporting each other. Many of us refer to it as our bear family. I think many new members are impressed by the camaraderie, the generosity, the willingness to share knowledge and to help students. It's pretty remarkable. And it's gratifying that so many members who received support when they started out now want to help others. We have a diverse membership. They share some concerns, but also have some very different ethics, cultures, and perspectives. To me, IBA is ideally a place for all of us who care about bears to respectfully interact and learn from each other, not just about the science, but about other people's lives and values. And hopefully we can learn how to disagree amicably. 
Admitting mistakes and willingness to change our minds as new facts emerge are strengths of science, not weaknesses. And our members should be able to disagree about some issues, but still work together on others. Honestly, it's been difficult lately for me to resist negativity and cynicism, not only from all the ecological and social problems facing the world, but also the eroding trust and all out assault on science and expertise by large segments of the American public. I believe most people want to feel that they are spending time on something useful, that lives have purpose and meaning, and that there is hope for a better life and a better world. My career working on bears provided that for me, and I feel so grateful. Although I can't seem to muster optimism in the face of all that's happening, I also try to remain hopeful because I know the good we are all capable of. I found this quote that I really like that says, optimism and hope are not the same. Optimism is the belief that the world is changing for the better. Hope is the belief that together we can make the world better by Jonathan Sachs. We're all in the midst of navigating the strange new pandemic world while trying to maintain some sort maintain some sort of normal life and work. In these crazy times, I do find comfort in moments of normalcy. And for me, that's hearing from friends and colleagues about their work on bears. That makes me happy. I'm looking forward to this meeting and excited to officially open the 27th International IBA Conference. Science-based approaches to conservation are the foundation of our mission. And this conference is a great opportunity to learn about some of the latest work being done. I'm very proud of IBA and I really wanna thank all the volunteers who have helped make us such a good organization. We're not perfect, but we care a lot and we try to do what's right. I hope you all have a productive meeting. Thanks. Thank you, John. I assume people can hear me. I'm Joe Clark, I'm with USGS in Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, I'm pleased to be able to moderate this first session. Um, given that this 27th IBA conference is in Kalispell, albeit virtually, I think it's fitting that we begin with a session looking at the status and management of grizzly bears in the lower 48 states in the US. We have an impressive cast of experienced speakers this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located, uh, who are the movers and shakers in the grizzly bear world. Um, we will have a panel discussion at the end of the presentation. So please hold your uh, questions until then, but you can please, I'm, I'm, I ask that the uh, conference attendees please uh, submit their questions as in the Q&A uh, um, um, box in the, in the Zoom link. And then finally, I wanna acknowledge uh, Lloyd Roberts as my co-moderator who's doing most of the Zoom duties here and obviously the brains of the operation. So without further ado, let's get to it. Um, our first speaker is Rick Mace who received his BS and MS degrees in wildlife biology from the University of Montana, Missoula, and a PhD from, uh, and he gave me a, a long Swedish name, which I'm not gonna fall for. It's Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Nice try, Rick. Uh, Rick for, worked for 40 years as a research biologist with Montana Fish and Wildlife, where he conducted field research on grizzly and black bears, he was PI on several long-term telemetry studies on grizzlies, looking at habitat requirements and impacts of human development. In 2004, he initiated a long-term study of grizzly bear demographics designed to estimate population trend and other vital rates in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. And that interagency study continues today. Rick has lived and worked in Kalispell since 1984. And the title of his talk is a brief history of grizzly bear population recovery efforts in the Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem, Montana. Rick? Okay, now how do we get this to go? Share screen. I don't, I don't see it. Middle. It's not there. So you hover over the bottom of your screen and select share screen, the bottom. Oh yeah, the green arrow, just a second. There you go, yep. 
Sorry. That's okay. Okay, am I going? No, you need to select your present mode and you're not on your first slide. So first slide and present and then start PowerPoint. There you go. I'm sorry about this. No, you're fine, perfect. Okay, are we going? Yes, you are. Okay, good morning everyone or whatever time it is where you happen to be living. My name as was mentioned is Rick Mace and I'm a retired uh, bear biologist for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and I live here in Kalispell, Montana. As a way of a brief introduction, I began my career in bear research in 1976, working on the first research project in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem after the bear was listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened in 1975. Therefore, I have somewhat of a unique perspective and have been asked to share that perspective on bear conservation in the Northern ecosystem with you all. We really have come a long way since the uh, early conference on uh, bear biology was held here in 1977. And I feel it's really unfortunate that you all weren't able to travel here as uh, it, this is truly a magnificent part of the world and the bears here are very, very interesting. As I mentioned, grizzly bears were listed as threatened in 1975 for lack of knowledge on population status and habitat effectiveness. Here in Kalispell, we sit right next to the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, one of the six ecosystems that was established under uh, the recovery plan to promote viable populations. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to the Northern Continental Divide and provide an overview of the ecosystem itself and the grizzly bears that inhabit this area, describe the status of the population when it was listed in 1975, and provide an update on the current biological situation in the ecosystem. As many of you may know, grizzly bears were extirpated throughout most of their historical range during the 18 and 1900s. The Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, some 25,000 square kilometers, is one such place along with the Yellowstone where there were still substantial numbers of bears present compared to the other ecosystems that were struggling from very low population sizes. When the ecosystem recovery lines were drawn in 1976, Grizzly bear distribution closely matched the area designated in yellow on this map. Very few bears inhabited the inner mountain valleys and virtually no bears still roamed out onto the great short grass prairie where the Rocky Mountains abut the Great Plains. Glacier National Park is about 17% of the ecosystem. It sits at the Northern end and a variety of non-roaded wilderness areas such as the Great Bear, the Bob Marshall and the Scapegoat are in the southern portion of the ecosystem. Through the 1950, from the 1950s through the early 70s, there continued a period of greatly increased timber harvest and associated road building across to access that resource. This increase in vehicular traffic into bear habitat, coupled with a poor attitude, public attitude towards bears, led to an increased mortality. Even after the bear was listed under the Endangered Species Act, grizzly bears continued to be legally hunted until 1991. When I started in 1976 as a field assistant, it was very difficult to find bears to study. At the time, the population was, was estimated to be between two and 300 bears, but of course, no one knew for sure. If over the course of the summer field season, we captured and radioed one or two grizzly bears in an area, we considered it a great success. At present, if we were to take a telemetry flight from Kalispell, going out and looking for bears, this is sort of what it would look like. Luckily, we'd find, we would pick up our first radio signal within five minutes of leaving town. And depending on the year at present, we might be following, trying to follow 40 to 50 radioed bears in an area. But that of course, hasn't always been so. The western side of the ecosystem is characterized by rugged mountains separate, separated by broad valleys. And there is a sharp demarcation between bear habitat and human settlement in this ecosystem. Mountainous areas were considered to be within the recovery zone for most part, and the adjacent valleys were not. It is within these rich valleys that most of our conflicts with bears now occur, and it has only been increasing over the years. Unsecured attractants, among other things, led to habituation and food conditioning of bears. In fact, over the last decade, grizzly bears have found themselves 
actively seeking out chickens, for example. 15 years ago, you never even heard about this, but now one of the biggest causes of bear conflicts in the valley are with 50 cent chickens. And it is keeping our bear management specialists very busy. Unlike the rest of the ecosystem, Glacier National Park is a sanctuary for bears in the sense that there's been no hunting for many, many years. For this reason, the density of bears in the Glacier Park is higher than elsewhere else in the ecosystem. Radio telemetry data show that as a consequence, annual home ranges in the park are about half the size of those outside of, in outside areas. However, radio data clearly show that bears in the park do leave the park at times, almost all of them. They may stay in the park for a year or two, but eventually wander out and probably come back. So the park is not a closed system for bears and bears within the park do have threats that generally come from outside. Glacier Park has very few roads and is considered a primarily a hiking park. Therefore, encounters with bears and hikers are common within the ecosystem, but very few encounters in Glacier Park have re really result in uh, physical contact. Over the years, there's been about 10 fatal attacks within the park. And 15 years ago or so, there were really no uh, fatalities outside of the park. But as the population has grown, well, we do have uh, that occurring every three or four years. Someone is uh, killed by a grizzly outside the park. The east side of the park abuts the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. Historically, many of the bears that did leave the park did so on the reservation where conflicts, primarily surrounding livestock depredations and unsecured garbage were a primary source of mortality. The front range of the Rockies, termed the Rocky Mountain Front, is also a superb grizzly bear habitat. Historically, bears thrived on the Great Plains until they were extirpated over 100 years ago. When the bear was listed in 1975, very few observations of bears were made out into this prairie habitat. As elsewhere, the, the primary uh, conflicts with uh, humans along the Rocky Mountain front is with livestock uh, depredations. Over the period of years, almost 25 years now, there's been a, a program of carcass redistribution where dead uh, animals up to maybe two to 300 a year that die near ranches are picked up and moved back into the backcountry where bears can feed on them in security. If this is a, a map of uh, just several grizzly bear uh, GPS locations over the years and shows clearly that bears are now uh, moving out onto the prairies and uh, the long linear features are river bottoms. So the bears do use the short grass prairie habitat some, but they're very tied to the river bottom corridors. Most of these corridors lead to ranches. Over the years, as conservation and pop, uh, as conservative population and habitat management programs were set in place and the population of grizzly bears began to respond, several programs were put in place that proved to be highly effective in getting that population to increase. There's a long, long list of them, but some of the top four or five include the formation of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee in 1982. And this was an effort by tribal, state, and federal agencies to coordinate activities uh, on grizzly bear conservation uh, throughout the NCDE. There was also a hunting season that had been going on for many years. And in 1991, that hunting, suit, hunting uh, program was halted due to a lawsuit. And the habitat management programs were set in place to reduce illegal mortality along forest open roads, limits on open, total and closed road density were set in place that resulted in closure of many, many uh, miles of roads that greatly in, increased security for grizzly bears. Back in the 70s, when we found a dead grizzly bear, it was always almost along the side of a road. And there was also a, a great shift in public attitude over the years from one of disdain to one of pride, or at least acceptance. And perhaps the most important program put in place during this period was uh, the hiring of bear management specialists that were scattered throughout the ecosystem to work and live in the communities where conflicts were high. These bear management specialists are credited with saving the lives of countless grizzly bears. Research was ongoing since 1975. However, 2004 marked a year when substantial knowledge of grizzly bear populations began to pour in with new technology. Two large scale programs were initiated. The first was a mark recapture study using DNA at rub trees and hair traps. And the other was a telemetry study of female survival and reproductive rates 
that was needed to estimate population trend. The DNA study revealed a population point estimate of 765 bears in 2004, and the telemetry study estimated a point estimate of between 2.5 and 3.0% per year. Using these two studies in tandem, it was now possible to estimate the population of grizzly bears. And as we sit here in, 19, in 2021, that population estimate point estimate is around 1,100 grizzly bears. Not only has the population increased in size, but it has also expanded over 60% in geographic distribution as well. The following graphic gives an example of how that distribution has changed since 1980. 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2020. And please remember when the species was listed in 1975, that yellow area pretty much confined all the grizzly bears that we knew about. If we look at this graph, we see that the, uh, the distribution of the Northern Continental Divide and the Greater Yellowstone are getting closer and closer. There are actual more observations uh, between the two ecosystems, but at uh, but present we're less than 40 kilometers apart from each other. However, this expansion has not come without challenges to bear managers and the public. Unfortunately, bears are often attracted to agri agricultural crops such as corn, wheat, and barley in these new uh, distributed areas. They are also attracted to spilled grain, to spilled grain near ranch homes that has further increased the tension between bears and people in these new occupied areas. Not only have they uh, moved out onto these prairie habitats, some individuals are now actually denning on the prairie up to 45 kilometers from the mountains. Several of these are female bears that have actually had litters of cubs out on the prairie and spend 100% of their time out on these prairies. So in conclusion, these recovery efforts have been viewed as a, a conservation success. Although there are those who still think that there are too many bears or too few bears. In one regard though, we are faced with challenges to date in implementing recovery programs. Perhaps the greatest challenges lay ahead as bears become more numerous in areas with fewer safeguards. And with that, I guess, am I taking questions? No, we'll hold the questions to the end. Thank okay. You. Thank Great. you. Excellent job, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. So next up. Stop sharing your screen, Rick. I can't. Uh, I'm not getting an arrow. Top at the very top of your. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's not an arrow to stop. Oh, stop here. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yep, yep. okay. So our next speaker is Hillary Cooley, whose wildlife career began working on mountain lions in Wyoming and then in Washington State where she received a master's and a PhD on mountain lion prey selection and population demographics at Washington State University. She is currently the grizzly bear recovery coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and she's worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service for about 10 years, first as the wolf recovery coordinator for the Northwest region, and then as the polar bear program lead in Alaska. She also has spent time working for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game as a regional wolf biologist. So Hillary's talk today is titled, Where Are We with Grizzly Bear Recovery in the Lower 48 States? So Hillary, can you share your screen? And Very good. Thanks, Joe. Morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I, uh, before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge the others in the recovery program here at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Jennifer, Wayne, Tom, Kate, and Justin. You'll hear more from Wayne later. Um, but a special thanks to Kate, who along with Lori and Andrea have put in many, many hours to make sure this program, this conference goes on successfully. So thanks, you guys. Um, and I, 
Today, I just want to give you kind of step back a little bit and give you an overview of our recovery efforts in the lower 48 in all of the ecosystems. And I'll give you the punchline right off the bat, although Rick kind of told me or kind of ruined the punchline. <laughs> and I'm trying to forward my slide here. Sorry. You can use your arrows. There we go. Yep. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> So grizzly bears were listed in 1975 on the endangered species list as a threatened species. And 46 years later, grizzlies are still listed on the endangered species list. We did a five year review earlier this year, the Fish and Wildlife Service did, and found that that status is still warranted. But uh, recovery certainly hasn't been that simple. It's, it's pretty, been pretty complicated. And what I wanna do today is hit on some high points and some low points of recovery over the years. Starting in 73, actually when Congress passed the Endangered Species Act into law, we one of the first species listed, again, as threatened in the lower 48 states. Um, they were listed primarily because of habitat loss, um, human caused mortality, and there were some other factors like isolation and genetic issues, increasing human use. And I, this is a, a nice um, map panel that kind of goes through time and really shows that range reduction. The left panel on the bottom right is about, about the time grizzly bears were listed. So you can see that their range um, they only existed at about 2% of their historic range by the time they were listed. And so shortly after listing, we got to, um, going on recovery planning pretty quick and developed a first recovery plan in 1982. We revamped that plan and published another one in 93. Since then, we've updated chapters, we've added to it, but that 93 plan st still serves as the the, the main recovery planning document we use to guide our efforts. And it outlines two primary requirements for recovery and delisting under the Endangered Species Act. Number one, for each of the six recovery zones, I'll show you those in a minute, um, we need to meet the demographic and the habitat recovery criteria. And you can see those down below the for each of the six ecosystems, there's three main requirements. We're looking to have a minimum population size. Uh, we're looking for a distribution of breeding females. And because human cause mortality was a primary um, listing factor, we're trying to keep human cause mortality levels uh, under a, a sustainable threshold. Habitat recovery criteria exist um, for a couple of the ecosystems. We, we still need to designate for the others, but um, they're based on the amount of secure core habitat. Um, also, we wanna limit, because human cause mortality is a primary factor for bears, we're trying to limit developed recreation sites, places like campgrounds where you have a lot of groups of people and interaction between bears and humans is potential and limit livestock allotments. Here are the recovery zones. I like this map on the left because it really gives a good um, feeling for why the recovery zones are where they are. You saw, and Rick talked a lot about the NCDE where there's big chunks of um, wilderness areas, Glacier National Park is there. That's common among all of the ecosystems. There's really good core habitat. Federal land um, is the primary ownership and it makes a big difference. Rick also mentioned the IGBC, Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. That was formed just after that first recovery plan was published. And it's a pretty unique committee, I think. And I, a lot of people recognize that as a, um, a reason for some of the success we've seen with grizzly bear recovery so far. The main mission is to coordinate. We've got many different agencies that are involved in managing habitat and bears. And so this is a way to um, get together, coordinate policy, management, research, all in the efforts of conserving and recovering grizzly bears. And this is the structure, which I think is important. Another reason that it's been successful 
we've got an executive committee um, made up of high level decision makers. So you got um, agency, state agency wildlife directors, uh, you've got regional directors for Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, and these folks get together twice a year. And so you've got these decision makers that are um, really in the know on what's going on with grizzly bears. They're actively involved and they give buy-in to their staff who are members of the subcommittees. So we have subcommittee for each of the individual ecosystems. They also get together twice a year to coordinate um, recovery efforts, mainly through a five-year plan that everybody keeps up to date. And as I mentioned, IGBC, I think it's been a, it's gone a long ways to help the progress we have seen in grizzly bear recovery across the lower 48. And this map on the left um, is a good indication of that. So again, you heard about the NCDE, the Northern Continental Divide, and that along with the Greater Yellowstone are two big populations. We have about a thousand bears or a little more in both of those. Those populations have expanded beyond the recovery zones. You can see those hashed areas there. That's the current distribution. Um, and they have both met the biological recovery criteria. Moving over to the Cavity Yak and the Selkirk, um, smaller ecosystems, recovery is in progress there. They're, they're slowly improving, but they do have a little ways to go before we have achieved um, recovery in those areas. And you're going to hear more about those four ecosystems from Cecily, Wayne, and Frank. So I won't talk much more about those. But I did want to talk about the Bitterroot and the Cascades, where we do not have any population of bears. The recovery plan, that 1993 recovery plan, has a number of goals. And one of the sub goals is to develop planning documents necessary to recover bears in those ecosystems. And we've done a lot of work to do that. Even though we don't have any bears, we've done a lot to develop the planning documents. Um, both have not been successful. <laughs> so I'll give you some, some more info on what happened in those two ecosystems. First in the Bitterroot, we started working on um, NEPA planning, National Environmental Policy Act process where we went out to the public and asked what the public thought about how, how do we recover bears in this ecosystem? Started that in 1995 and developed um, a draft environmental impact statement outlining alternatives for ways we can recover bears there. And we actually decided, um, we, we finalized an environmental impact statement and made a decision to introduce bears in the, in the Bitterroot in 2000. Shortly after that, we were challenged by the state of Idaho, uh, challenged in court. And just a few months later, the service abandoned the decision to reintroduce. Uh, it was a real political process. The good thing is that we do have um, good potential for bears to recolonize naturally. Um, you can see that map on the bottom there. All those black triangles are verified observations of grizzly bears outside the distributions from the NCDE and the Greater Yellowstone. And so um, we think there is potential that bears will get there on their own. It's just gonna take a while. And there's lots of juicy details from that Bitterroot process. And if you're interested in reading up on those, uh, my friend Steve Netto put a book out recently and Michael Dax also has a book out there. I'd take a look at those if you're interested in more. We went through a similar process in the North Cascades. Jointly, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the North Cascades National Park went through a NEPA process, again, going out to the public and saying, how do we, how should we recover bears here? It's a recovery zone, we don't have any bears. And we put a draft environmental impact statement out, went out for public comment. And then the next few years was a real little on again, off again process. Um, Secretary Bernhardt, Secretary Zinke both showed up in person. Um, and in last year, we terminated that process. We're challenged in court and we're still in litigation over it. Um, you know, we're under a new administration now and that administration has been reviewing all regulations 
And so we think they're looking into that right now. Can't tell you if that's gonna change anything in the Cascades or not. But unfortunately, the, the, few, the natural recolonization potential is not quite as bright as the Bitterroot because we just don't have any big populations nearby. Okay, um, just get into our history of delisting efforts, both in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and both not successful. Um, it, it, you know, grizzly bears, people are passionate about them for a lot of reasons, and that's a really good thing. But passion takes the form of legal challenges, of petitions, of all sorts of things, and um, sometimes it can hinder our efforts. And that's the history in the GYE. So, um, we, grizzlies uh, in a Yellowstone ecosystem achieved recovery in 2003 and we delisted them a few years later. We were challenged in court and lost and we appealed to the Ninth Circuit and we lost. We went through that whole process again in 2017 um, and have not been successful to date. So um, we have two ecosystems, as I mentioned, they both have met the biological recovery criteria but we still have bears listed throughout the lower 48 as a threatened species. And meanwhile, we have more bears in more places. We have more bears on private lands, um, more conflicts, and we're seeing tolerance decline. And um, it's, it's a tough time for bears right now. And that's where we're right now. We're trying to figure out what our next steps are as the Fish and Wildlife Service, as managers of the, of the Endangered Species Act. Um, do we try and delist again? We haven't been successful yet. Um, how do we provide relief to people that are living with bears and experiencing real conflict? You know, and then recently we've had a huge influx of people moving to Montana, moving to Wyoming, Idaho and grizzly bear habitat. Some of them don't even know they're moving to grizzly bear uh, range. So how do we reach all those people? And then how do we continue to recover and conserve bears in this really difficult political climate that we're in today? It's, it's, it's a challenging time for bears, for agencies that manage bears. And these are some of the questions that we're struggling with right now. Hopefully we'll establish a path forward for grizzly bear recovery soon. And um, maybe by the next conference, I'll have another update for you. Thanks everybody for your time. Thank you, Hillary. Okay. So next up is Wayne Casworm, who has a BS from the University of Idaho and an MS from Montana State University. He has over 35 years experience in grizzly bear research and management with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Montana Department of Fish and Wildlife and Parks. His primary duties include grizzly and black bear research in Montana, Idaho, Washington, and British Columbia. He's been involved in monitoring grizzly bears and recovery in the Cabinet Yak, Selkirk, and North Cascades recovery zones, and has assisted in developing the Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan implemented grizzly bear population augmentation in the Cabinet Mountains and, and is involved in monitoring bear food production and grizzly bear genetics. Wayne is a science advisor to the North Cascades and Selkirk Cabinet Yak Grizzly Bear Subcommittees of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. And today is his talk is uh, titled Cabinet Mountain Grizzly Bear Augmentation Mo uh, Monitoring. So without further ado, take it away, Wayne. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, appreciate that introduction and uh, would like to acknowledge uh, a number of co-authors that you can see on the screen, both from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And, uh, all of the folks that you see listed there are responsible in, in a major part way for the success of the program. So today I'd, I'd like to spend some time on the research background that went into the decision to augment the population, the test of augmentation techniques that was conducted early on, uh, go into present day augmentation, as well as looking at the genetic monitoring program, some notable movements by some of the bears and and conclude with a few lessons learned 
uh, as part of the program here. The uh, Cavity Yak Recovery Area, you've seen several maps here, is located in Northwest uh, Montana and uh, also Northern Idaho. Uh, it abuts British Columbia to the north. Um, it, uh, the size of the recovery area itself is about 6,800 square kilometers, though we certainly get bears outside of those boundaries as well. The Cabinet Mountains uh, are the southerly 60% of this recovery area. And that's probably what I'm gonna be talking about mostly here today, but recognize there is another 40% of the recovery area to the north. The uh, original study that was done in the Cabinet Mountains that I uh, assisted in conducting from 1983 to 1988 uh, came up with some recommendations and some conclusions. And those are basically that the population was quite small and probably fewer than 15 individuals. We saw little observed reproduction from some of the collared bears and those collared bears experienced high mortality rates. Nor did we see any movement of bears into or out of the Cabinet Mountains during that time. And uh, the study recommended several things which included population augmentation by moving some bears into the area and programs to reduce mortality as well as affect habitat security by increasing that. We did uh, prepare an environmental assessment uh, or a plan in 1988 with two main action alternatives. The first being to augment the population in the Cabinet Mountains with eight bears that we would bring in from other, other uh, populations and also cross fostering with black bears. And the cross fostering program would take zoo born grizzly bears and place them in the natal dens of black bears by removing her cubs and giving her grizzly bear cubs to raise. We did encounter significant public opposition. Uh, we agreed uh, with, to postpone the program for one year and engage a citizens advisory group. We also agreed to eliminate the cross fostering program uh, there was a lot of controversy and maybe some misunderstanding there as well. We agreed to do a test of the technique with four bears initially, because this really hadn't been done before, and there were questions about the how well this might work. At the conclusion of the test, we would, we would return to our advisory group with results and determine a future action. The uh, the augmentation had some, had some criteria, some sideboards, and that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service would conduct the test by bringing independent females from another population. And when I say independent, I'm referring to bears that are roughly aged two to six prior to first reproduction. Bears must have no history of conflicts with humans. They will be backcountry animals. And furthermore, we would move those bears in midsummer to take advantage of food supplies, largely in the form of huckleberries, uh, occurring in the Cabinet Mountains to induce bears to uh, stay put, shall we say. We had two major uh, kind of success criteria. And the first was that transplants were expected to stay within the, or must stay within the target area for at least one year. Obviously, when you're moving young bears, you're collaring these bears, and those collars are basically your uh, ability to track the program. You can't keep a collar on a young growing bear for a large period of time, but we felt that if we could at least know that those bears stayed there for one annual cycle, we were at least headed in the right direction. Of course, ultimately, we want to see those young bears reproduce with native males in the Cabinet Mountains. So um, between, starting in 1990, we uh, then moved four grizzly bears from Southeast British Columbia into the Cabinet Mountains. And uh, three of the four bears were known to remain in the target area for at least one year. Uh, one bear did leave the target area, but was captured and returned uh, and released. One bear did produce a cub, but both bears died. And this did not quite satisfy our criteria for success because that bear was impregnated before we moved it to the Cabinet Mountains and so therefore did not breed with a Cabinet Mountains male. By 1996, uh, all of the bears involved with the test had lost their radio collars. And so we instituted a trapping program and a hair snagging program for genetic purposes from 1997 to 2004. 
By 2004, we were able to identify at least one of the bears uh, that was still present in the Cabinet Mountains and also information from parentage that she had reproduced. And uh, this was done typically by hair snagging and parentage techniques. So with that information, we returned uh, to our stakeholders committee and we began to discuss the results and we came to an agreement that we would continue the augmentation uh, in a slightly different way. Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks joined that effort uh, by doing the capture work in the Flathead River drainage on the US side of the border. And Fish and Wildlife Service would then uh, place the radio collars on the animal and do the monitoring in the Cabinet Mountains. Since 2005, we've had 18 additional bears that were added to this population, 10 females and eight males. And in a little while, I'll describe why uh, we're looking at males now instead of just moving females. So we have added a total of 22 bears since 1990. Uh, that's uh, 14 females, eight males. Eight bears are known to have left the target area, but three did return on their own. Six bears are known dead, and you can see some of the causes here, some natural mortality, a train kill, some illegal mortality, misidentification by a black bear hunter, as well as a self-defense. But we also know of two females and two males that are part of the program that we know have reproduced. So uh, a lot of our genetics work comes from a hair snag program. Uh, we snag hairs at rub trees and at corrals, which are a strand of barbed wire with a trail camera on it and some lure that's placed in the center to induce bears to cross the wire and leave us a hair sample. And with this uh, information, we get uh, obviously genotypes from these individuals and we're able to do parentage to determine whether or not uh, number one, our augmentation bears are still in the target area, or number two, have they reproduced? Of course, we also use this information to look at gene flow and linkage between Cabinet Yak or Cabinet Mountains and other populations in the area, as well as looking at, we use this technique in the Selkirks uh, also. So, I've got a, a graphic here, a family tree of the cabinets, and I recognize this is a little bit busy here, but let's kind of look at it line by line. Uh, the blue squares represent males, the uh, pink ovals represent females. Across the top, you can see our six founders in this population, and those represent four of the bears that I mentioned were part of the augmentation, as well as two native males in that population. So those six founders are actually, uh, you know, are, are been followed by 14 first generation offspring, 22 second generation offspring, and we're now into our third generation with four individuals there as well. Um, I mentioned some of the interest in, uh, in moving males, and a lot of that stems from, if you look at the upper left, bear CU-29M, has a lot of lines emanating from him. And those lines represent his union with a respective female and then go to the offspring that were produced by that union. A lot of lines coming out of CU-29M and because he was such a successful reproducer and the fact that his genes represent or are demonstrated in a lot of the offspring, we were concerned a little bit about the diversity. And so we started moving males into this population as well. However, you can see uh, in the graphic on the box on CU-29M that he died in 2019. And hopefully there's gonna be a few more males that will enter into this population. Uh, I got a graphic here on the, with maps that represent some of the movements of several of the bears involved. And while most of the bears stayed in the Cabinet Mountains, there have been a few notable movements where some bears returned uh, to their point of capture. But I might just point out a couple. Uh, the red line at the very top of the graphic there indicates a female bear that was released in the Cabinet Mountains but went all the way to Alberta specifically Waterton Park in Alberta, and then returned to the Cabinet Mountains and denned in the Cabinet Mountains. 
the yellow line represents a male that moved south uh, after being released in the, in the uh, Cabinet Mountains and went all the way down to the Selway Bitterroot, spent two months in the Selway Bitterroot wilderness before returning to the Cabinet Mountains and ultimately going back to the Northern Continental Divide. And so with GPS telemetry, we have the opportunity to record some of these unusual movements uh, and uh, just representing some of that as well. So uh, I might talk a little bit about some of the results of the, of the program. And I'll be the first to admit that sample sizes are pretty small here with 22 bears. Uh, if we want to look at whether or not they satisfied the first criteria of staying there for one year, I'm going to reduce that sample size to 18 by eliminating four bears that died on the study area in less than one year. So starting with that sample of 18, we do know that 11 of those bears did stay in the population. And so that's a roughly 60% success. We can tease that sample apart a little bit more here by looking at males versus females. And uh, certainly females were a little more successful from the standpoint of staying in the population at 70% uh, of those individuals stayed, 50% of the males stayed. And again, I recognize the limitations of the sample size, but you can also see the numbers there as well. It did appear that possibly younger bears are a little more adaptable to augmentation with a slightly higher percentage of bears less than five years old that uh, stayed in the population. Uh, although not that much difference, but certainly some, uh, some advantage to younger bears. And also the distance from the point of capture to the point of release. And that if we have put a greater distance between capture and release, we have a little better chance of having bears stay in the area that you intended. Uh, I did calculate survival rates uh, for the bears that we moved. And I calculated them by first year, second year, and all years combined. Uh, just to see what things look like. And yes, we did have most of our mortality uh, from these animals occur during the first year. You can see that female survival is ranging around 60%, male survival about 70%. In second and third year, we did not have any of these bears that were known to, uh, to die. Overall, uh, for survival, we're looking at around 75 to 77%, depending upon the sex of the individual. You might have heard me earlier that I thought that the Cabinet Mountains population was 15 bears or fewer uh, back in 1988 when I concluded the research there. But in retrospect and looking back, I think we were probably only looking at it about half a dozen bears in the Cabinet Mountains in 1990 when the augmentation program started. Our current population is around 25 to 30 and we are continuing to move bears. In conclusion, we believe that the augmentation program is the main reason we still have grizzly bears in the Cabinet Mountains. We have not detected any other bears feeding to the cabinets naturally and surviving to reproduce. We recommended continuing the program uh, at a slow but steady pace. Now, we did not move a bear this past summer due to issues with wildfire. Um, but uh, we, again, are looking at continuing the program. However, uh, you know, my concluding statement here is that uh, there are risks for this program. Uh, they don't all stay where you put them. Uh, there are, could be losses to the, obviously to the donor population. There are also issues for the target population in that if something goes wrong in terms of bears becoming conflict animals, you run the risk of eroding uh, public uh, tolerance for bears in that area. So I know we're going to have a chance for questions here later on, but I'd like to uh, extend gratitude and thanks to the funding entities involved with this, as well as uh, British Columbia for providing us bears for the, the four bears for the initial test of the program. That's what I've got here today, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Good job. Up next is Frank Von Mann, who earned a PhD in ecology from the University of Tennessee in 1994, joined USGS in 2000 with research focused on large carnivores in the southeastern U.S. Frank is currently a supervisory research wildlife biologist with USGS in Bozeman, Montana. 
He moved to Montana in 2012 to become team leader of the interagency grizzly bear study team. And Frank has collaborated on bear research projects in a variety of bear species in Ecuador, Sri Lanka, China, Malaysia. As most of you know, I'm sure he was president of IBA from 20, uh, 2007 to 2013 and has served on the council for the past 15 years. And uh, I would encourage you to please also don't forget to submit questions for the, for the uh, discussion following that. We've only got a few, so uh, some more questions would be great. And Frank's talk is Yellowstone Grizzly Bear Recover, Resilience of an Iconic Population. Frank. Thanks, Joe. And good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, in this presentation, we kind of want to provide a retrospective regarding the science, biology, and challenges uh, behind the recovery of the Yellowstone grizzly bear populations. You know, what lessons have we learned and what are some considerations uh, for the future? Now, Hillary already showed this, this map, but I, I want to show it again because it, it does kind of show why the Yellowstone population is unique. It is the most southern population of grizzly bears in, in North America. It's also been isolated to, for quite some time, possibly as, as, as long as uh, 100 years. And the story of recovery of the Yellowstone grizzly bear population really starts with uh, controversy and uncertainty. And that controversy really occurred in, in the late 60s, early 1970s, uh, during a time when the Park Service decided to uh, close the, the open pit garbage dumps that were there in the park and outside the park, um, it, it, and it, which bears were, were, were often feeding. And that turned out to be the right decision, but the, the, the sudden closure of that uh, caused a lot of controversy because a lot of bears died in a relatively short period of time. Uh, more than well over 200 bears died in, in about five year time period for a population that might have been as, as little as fewer than 250 animals. So. There were a lot of concerns about that. There was a National Academy of Sciences review done in response to that. And that led, that among others, led to the, the listing of, of uh, the lower 48 grizzly bears under the Endangered Species Act in 1974, as Hillary indicated. But it also led to the recommendation to establish an independent science team, uh, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team, specifically for the Yellowstone ecosystem and that team now exists of uh, eight different uh, federal state and tribal agencies and the, really the point behind that establishment of that team was to bridge the gap that often exists between science and policy so it was actually by by design set up for the science to uh, inform and, 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 and the, the policy agencies agencies that, that set the policy through the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee that uh, Hillary mentioned as well, that was established in 1983. And because a lot of the agencies that are on that committee uh, manage the land or manage the wildlife populations, there was an, an, a direct link to making changes on the ground that would be in support of, of grizzly bear conservation. So there was a direct link between research policy and management. And that turned out to be very effective, as, as Hillary indicated. Um, the focus initially was on reducing adult female mortality because that was determined from the science to be a limiting factor to the population, as well as establishing habitat standards. And this was all primarily within the Fish and Wildlife Service designated recovery zone. Those efforts paid off and started to really show the the first signs of recovery in the in the mid 1980s is when we when we recently put all our, our data together and looked at at the population trend over four decades, uh, which is you know pretty phenomenal uh, record um, to look at the changes over such a time frame. And what we've seen is uh, we, we we started seeing that growth in the 1980s uh, with very robust growth do, during the 90s. And then we started seeing some slowing down of population growth in uh, starting in the early 2000s and a little more about that later on. Of course, when you have um, population growth, you also typically have range expansion for an isolated population like this. So we've seen about a threefold increase in 
occupied range from those earlier decades. And it's important here to mention um, these, these boundaries. Um, the, the black boundaries represent the, the national parks and with Yellowstone National Park being kind of the core of this ecosystem. The Fish and Wildlife Service recovery zone is the, the yellow line. So that's where most of the federal land is. 98% is, is, is federal land. So there's a lot of control and a lot of ability to manage that land for grizzly bear conservation. And then the blue line is the, what we refer to as the demographic monitoring area. And that represents a suitable habitat that was delineated based on suitable habitat. And it's also the area that we actually monitor the population. It's about 50,000 square kilometers. Now you'll notice that range has, expansion, has expanded beyond that blue line, beyond the demographic monitoring area. And those are increasingly areas with a lot more human influence. And as we will talk about later, that has some consequences for, um, for the population in terms of conflicts. Now, of course, with larger populations and, and range expansion, we've also seen uh, changes in grizzly bear density over time. This is based on essentially a spatially explicit, um, spatial, uh, spatially explicit reconstruction of the population over time. And you see that there's some areas that, that throughout the, the ecosystem where we have higher densities. And that played a role in, in, in us seeing some density dependent effects in the population. Uh, for example, what we've seen with cub survival in areas with higher densities, we, since the early 2000s, we have seen cub survival decline in some of those areas. We've also seen some reproductive suppression and those were actually responsible for that slowing of population growth in, uh, that started in, in the early 2000s. So there's some density dependent effects going on, indicators of, of reaching carrying capacity within the ecosystem. It's also been a lot of attention to uh, genetics of the Yellowstone grizzly bear population. If you look at the kind of a latitudinal gradient from northern edge of the continents uh, down to the, to the most certain population being Yellowstone, we do see that heterozygosity of genetic diversity declines across those population. And, and Yellowstone is one of the, the lower ones together with the, the certain portion of the Selkirk population. And so there has been some concern about that, but when we recently looked at effective population size and your genetically effective population size uh, with a different number of, of estimators, all those estimators were showing an increase in the effective population size as the, the census population size increased. All of them were above the, the critical threshold of uh, the inbreeding uh, threshold of, of 50. And uh, one estimated the parent based on parentage assignments uh, also was showing numbers close to the 500 threshold that, that you need for genetic viability in the long term. So there's a lot of really good news in, in terms of genetics. Uh, of course, genetic diversity won't increase unless there is some connectivity. And this is where uh, some of the maps that uh, I think Rick showed us as well and Hillary um, is, is important because if you look at occupied range, and that's the hatched area in this map, um, for Yellowstone and compare that to Northern Continental Divide, the distance between the two edges is only about 60 kilometers. So we are now within basically striking distance for male dispersal to occur. Uh, and on top of that, we see some of those blue areas outside the hatched areas. Those are areas where we refer to as maybe present range. Those are areas where we have recorded sightings or, or records of, of grizzly bears. And interestingly, many of those areas, as well as some of the range expansion that we've seen coincide with step selection models we developed uh, for male uh, movement models between the Northern Continental Divide and the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So there's lots of indicators that we may soon have truly genetic connectivity. And even if that doesn't happen naturally, there's still the option of uh, some sort of genetic augmentation by uh, translocating individual bears, of course. It's also been a lot of attention in the last decades uh, on changes in uh, food sources. And we're primarily looking at the high calorie foods here. And, and there's really four major food, high calorie food resources that are important during the hypophagic period for bears. That's army cutworm moths, uh, cutthroat trout around Yellowstone Lake, white buck pine stands, and then different um, ungulate herds from bison and, and, and elk. 
And the biggest change that we've seen that started occurring in the early 2000s was really for the white buck pine food source. And that's the, the gray areas in this map that are distributed throughout the high elevation areas of the ecosystem. We've seen about 75% tree mortality in some areas, primarily due to mountain pine beetle and to a lesser degree of wildfire and blister rust. And that has raised a lot of concerns about, you know, are bears able to maintain body conditions? So we recently looked at that by looking at the seasonal body fat gain for bears across the, the active season uh, and see if those were different in the first decade of this century versus the second decade when most of those changes had already taken place. And what we found was that there's really no, for both females and males, there's no difference between uh, seasonal body fat gain for those two decades is a strong indication of their uh, resilience despite substantial change in, in the distribution and availability of food resources. We're seeing that that, that really hasn't changed uh, between those two decades. And for, for females, particularly that is important um, by the end of, of the active season before they enter the end, they, the typical female will be well above 20% body fat. And that's the blue line you see on the, on the left graph. That's kind of a reference for uh, limited uh, for um, reproductive success. So of course, with recovery success and uh, biological recovery come challenges. And one way to measure, uh, one, one indicator of that is, uh, is the number of conflicts that we're seeing. Now, interestingly, within the recovery zone, we're, we're not seeing a, a major trend in conflicts, and that's because it's mostly federal land, a lot of control on, 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 on in terms of prevention of, of conflicts. But as soon as you start looking at uh, the demographic monitoring area where there's more multiple use lands, more private land, and especially outside the demographic monitoring area, we see that conflicts have increased, especially during the last decade. And a lot of those conflicts are, you know, especially related to livestock depredation. So, the risk in that, of course, is that over time that erodes support for, for grizzly bear uh, conservation. And um, that's, that's, of course, a concern to managers. Where there are conflicts, there's also mortalities, of course, and we've seen the, both the number of mortalities and, and the range of and the area where, where mortalities occur increase over time as well. And that's, uh, even though mortalities are within the thresholds for established for sustainability of this population, that does raise concerns with, another, with other groups of, of stakeholders. So obviously human dimensions are becoming um, more critical aspect of, of grizzly bear conservation as populations start expanding in, into more areas where uh, we have more human influences on the landscape. So the key points from, from this is that, um, and I think others have alluded to this as well, but you know, the Endangered Species Act was a really important instrument in terms of starting the recovery process. Interagency science has been very important to directly inform policy and that the policies led to some really visionary management in, in the 1980s that really contributed to the, the start of this conservation success story. And I also want to recognize that, you know, we, we always give management that, um, credits, but we should also give the species some credit. Species biology played a big role. When given a chance, grizzly bears uh, are very adaptable and they're very resilient and they will respond to the right um, conservation actions. So biological recovery and resilience uh, have, have a lot to do with that. I think there is an important future consideration um, with, with climate change coming down the road, uh, with huge changes expected in the ecosystem in terms of land use change with people moving in en masse from, from other areas, uh, a lot of changes in recreational patterns. We should be thinking of conservation from framework that is that really integrates biology, land change science and human dimensions uh, in, in the future. Uh, I think it's an important consideration. And, and to that point, um, the next presentation by Cecily Costello will really deal with, with an important component of that is the human dimensions aspect. And so with that, I would like to recognize our team members um, from the eight different agencies that, that serve on the, on the interagency grizzly bear study team. 
and the agencies that support us um, without without that support um, we would not be able to do all this important work thank you very much thank you frank and uh, with that introduction we'll move into the next talk by cecily costello who got her bachelor's degree from Florida State in 1986, and then went on and got a, a master's at uh, State University of New York, and then later a PhD from Montana State. She has been working as a wildlife research bi biologist for Montana F Fish, Wildlife, and Parks since about 2015. And uh, she supervises grizzly bear trend monitoring program in the Northern Continental Divide and is a member of the grizzly bear study team in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Her professional career is devoted almost entirely to the study of black and grizzly bears, where she's worked at the University of Montana, the Hornocker Wildlife Institute slash Wildlife Conservation Society, the New Mexico Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit and Western Ecosystems Technologies. She's been an associate editor of the journal URSAS since 2006 and served as treasurer for IBA from 2007-2013. And her talk, talk is Human Viewpoints about Grizzly Bear Management in Montana. Cecily? Hey, everyone. Um, I re pre-recorded my presentation, so I'm going to try to hit play and see if this works. So. Hello, I'm Cecily Costello, and I'm a research wildlife I'd like to wrap up this first session by diving into the social context of grizzly bear recovery in 2048, especially as we review advice on recent work. As you learned from previous presentations, we made enormous progress on recovering grizzly bears in 2048. This map shows an area where presence has been documented during the last 10 years. Two populations. Did I do something? I think you paused it. Okay. So sorry. That's okay. You just click. <laughs> and then can you also turn turn up your volume a little bit on your computer too, if you can? Okay. Thank you. Let me try again. I'm so sorry. Nope, that's fine. Oh, don't worry about it. We have a good understanding of how to reduce human cause mortality from populations in four public land areas. Or learn more every day about her, how bears are expanding outside of these four areas. And our experience with the cap and cat augmentation is valuable for further restoration efforts. So, all around, we have knowledge and tools needed to continue the recovery and restore populations. Cascades. But the next steps will really be determined by people. We need to figure out how dedicated we are as a society to the vision proposed in the recovery plan. And we need to understand if people will accept bears in new places where they have been absent for decades. To help understand public attitudes, I'm going to briefly describe some findings from two efforts in Montana. The first was a scientific human attitude survey conducted during November of 2019 to January of 2020. This survey was mailed to over 5,000 residents in Montana and was designed to give us a snapshot of the views of Montanans. The second effort was a set of recommendations developed by a Grizzly Bear Advisory Council, also formed in 2019 by the government. This group was made up of members from diverse backgrounds who met a total of 15 times in person or virtually. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors of the Human Attitudes study, including a graduate student and faculty members from the University of Montana College of Forestry and Conservation, and biologists and a social scientist from Edgar. I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the Advisory Council 
and the support team for the advisory council, which included members of various state, federal, and tribal agencies. So let's get to the results. Um, a major finding of the survey is that there is strong support for grizzly bears in Montana. A very high majority of Montana. Oh my God. People strongly agree that grizzly bears have a right to exist in Montana, that they are beautiful animals, that they are part of what makes Montana special, and even that it is important to maintain the self sustaining population of the state. These numbers are far, far more supportive than what we observed for wolves in the state, where a 2012 household survey indicated that more than one third of Montanans reported they were very intolerant of in wolves being on the Montana landscape. We also found that a majority of Montanans reported they feel threatened. Roughly half agreed that they avoid recreating in areas with grizzly bears, but only about 20% agreed that they feel personally threatened by bears, and only 7% agreed that grizzly bears negatively affect their economics. Only about 20% of Montanans are involved in agriculture, so it's understandable that a minority might feel an economic impact. We asked about people's Emotional responses to grizzly bears in the two scenarios. We asked them to imagine taking a hike in an undeveloped area of the state and we were at home. A strong majority of Montanans reported being scared if they encountered the bear in either setting, but a strong majority also reported that they would be pleased if it happened in an undeveloped setting, a little bit less so if it happened in their home. These results demonstrate the Conflicting emotions that bears elicit. The advisory council was also supportive of grizzly bears. First, they supported fully recovered populations. They supported having bears in all four recovered areas, including the now vacant and urban places. And they recognized the value of connectivity. Of course, they also made sure to balance these conservation goals with considerations of human safety and livelihoods. In our survey, we wanted to get an idea of how people responded to bears in different parts of the state. Not knowing if people had direct knowledge of recovery zones, we made a map that identified areas of the state by numbers, and then asked people how they felt about the size of the bear population in these different regions. The first interesting finding was that 37 to 65 percent of responses were I don't know in the areas. Excluding these I don't know responses, the most frequent response was that the bear population is the right size now in all areas, including those with high density resident populations to areas with very few bears. The views of people varied across the entire scale much too high to much too low, but different differed only slightly among the different areas. The responses were skewed a little bit to the too high in, um, in areas where there are healthy bear populations, like in the CDP, which is area number three, and in Yellowstone, which is area number six. Um, and then interestingly, in area number four, the literate, where there are no current red bears, is skewed slightly toward too low. In contrast to those findings, we did find that people were more decisive about their views when we asked them about the types of areas that bears might be present, from a forested area to agricultural areas to suburban or urban areas. In this case, we found that only 5 to 9% of respondents said, I don't know. Um, we found that there was very high acceptance of grizzly bears on public lands um, and forested areas, but acceptance declined with greater agricultural or human presence. It was interesting to see that we observed greater acceptance of grizzly bears anywhere they become established on their own than in some places where bears currently exist, such as areas with agriculture in small towns. The rural 
rural fringes of development in suburban residential areas. This indicates that people may expect bears to naturally avoid these areas, but we know that that is not necessarily so, and some bears navigate these landscapes successfully. Our survey indicated moderate to high willingness of Montanans to take actions to prevent bear human conflict. Most agreed that people should learn to meet with grizzly bears near their home. A high majority had or would be willing to secure attractants on their property, follow food storage guidelines on public lands, and carry bear spray. A smaller majority had or would be willing to participate in livestock harvest removal programs or change their livestock practices. The advisor the advisory council recommended that more resources are needed to address bears in conflict and specifically recognize the value of open landscapes for grizzly bear conservation. Some of the specific recommendations they made were to increase funding for the state livestock loss board, both for compensation and for proactive programs. They wanted to develop local sanitation ordinances to reduce bear access to garbage. And they want to increase the number of the capacity of agency bear management specialists, like those that work for Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks. Lastly, we wanted to gauge people's attitudes about a potential risk of bear hunting season that might occur after the testing. From the survey, we found that 83% supported some form of hunting, but 17% thought that grizzly bear should never be. Nearly half of Montanans responded that they support enough hunting to manage the population size of this bears. On the topic of hunting, the advisory council was unable to reach consensus and it was the only topic that they did not reach consensus on. The proportion of members in favor of hunting was 77%, which was very close to the proportion of our statewide survey, which was 83%. Those in favor of hunting pointed out that a scientifically sound hunt could be conducted and that hunting could be used as a tool to manage resilience. Those opposed to hunting pointed out that a potential hunt was a contributing factor to public opposition to its waste process. To summarize, I wanted to put some of these findings into a perspective of the advantages and the challenges that we have to further conservation of grizzly bears in the lower 48. Some of the advantages we saw from our survey and our work with the advisory council was that there's high support for grizzly bears. People tend to think that they are beautiful, special, and they even support sustainability. Bears are highly acceptable on public lands. Despite their fear, people are pleased to see bears on the landscape. And Montanans appear to be willing to follow food storage orders and carry bear spray, at least in concept. The challenges we face are, of course, fear, which is an understandable reaction to the land and to the dangerous. We found that there's lower acceptance of bear presence in areas of human occupancy and agricultural use. Um, we found that most people think bear populations are the right size now, so that might might show some resistance to expansion and restoration of grizzly bears in areas where they don't currently exist. And people were um, a bit more hesitant to take actions on their own property and into areas where they're living uh, on public land. These findings seem to indicate that there's a desire by people that bears and humans live separately. But total separation is not necessarily totally achievable. Humans live within, on the edges, and in between large public landscapes. Not only are our bear populations growing and expanding, but human populations are also growing and expanding into previously undeveloped areas. For example, 30,000 new rural homes were built in the counties surrounding the Northern Continental Divide during 1990 to 2016. Um, since COVID, we have seen uh, an increase in people moving to the rural West and to Montana. So our continued challenge is to find ways that human 
Indians and he was embarrassed to share the landscapes of North America and the Middle East. Thank you for listening. I wanted to put the websites where you can find the reports from the Human Attitude Survey and the Advisory Council, as well as some other materials. Great, thank you very much. Um, this is kind of unusual, but uh, this is where we normally would applaud for all of our speakers. So if you want to do so in the privacy of your own homes, please, please do. And so we have some time set up for a question and answer uh, session. And so I'll try to coordinate that the best I can. Um, first of all, I had a question from Hil for Hillary. What were the primary reasons for the delisting attempts that in the in the Greater Yellowstone uh, ecosystem? Why why were those? What were the primary reasons that those attempts failed? Um, okay, thanks, Joe. I guess there were a couple. There were several reasons. The first attempt to delist, uh, primarily, we lost because we. The court said we inadequately explained why white bark pine was not a threat. So we had seen declines in white bark pine, why that wasn't a threat. Um, the second time in 2017, there were three main reasons that the court cited we lost. One was uh, long term genetic viability. This is Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. You remember on the maps, it was um, isolated from the other uh, ecosystems. Second was uh, recalibration. So recalibration means um, the study team was developing a new method to estimate population size, and that was tied to mortality limits. Um, the court said that states needed to commit to this new method um, before delisting, and that had not occurred. And then finally, the court said we failed to consider how delisting the Yellowstone ecosystem would impact the remaining populations. Could you could you explain what that a little bit more about that one, Hillary? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we had grizzly bears were listed throughout the lower forty eight states, and effectively, what we did is we said we're going to draw a circle around the Yellowstone ecosystem and delist it. And everything else is gonna stay threatened. We're not gonna to touch it. Um, so the court wanted us to address the remaining populations and make sure it was still something that could be on the list, a valid listable entity. And that by removing protections in the Yellowstone ecosystem, it wasn't going to be detrimental to the remaining ecosystems. Okay. Good, thank you. Um, uh, just a follow-up question. Um, you know, it seems like, uh, is there any consideration for going at the Northern Continental Divide population instead of yep. the GYE? Yeah, and um, I think it was about 2018, we were um, considering delisting the NCDE because we had that recovery criteria, we let the public know we were gonna be putting out a proposal for public comment. Um, but because of the litigation going on in the Yellowstone, because we were not successful, we put a hold on that and we have not moved to date. Okay, good, great, thank you. Here's a question for Wayne. Are mortality sources very different between resident and translocated bears? particularly the first year? Actually, uh, not that much difference. Uh, we see a variety of different sources of mortality, both in the uh, resident population, as well as the augmented bears that uh, we have placed there. And it's just a variety of different things. Uh, and I mentioned on the augmentation bears that we see some uh, obviously some illegal kills and mistaken identity from black bear hunters. We had a train kill, um, uh, a variety of things. And, you know, we're looking at the kind of the same sort of variety in the resident population as well. So I'll admit there are small numbers on the augmentation bears, but I really don't see any dramatic difference in the mortality cause between those two segments. 
Wayne, uh, I'll follow up with a question. Uh, the, uh, the mortality rates that you presented, did those include the, the animals that left, uh, you know, from uh, homing or whatever? Uh, and if not, what would the what would be the success rate on those reintroduced bears? You know, the ones that lived and stayed. And and so that does represent the ones that lived and stayed, or, okay. or the ones that stayed, because I was trying to represent there the impacts to those bears on a local level. I'll admit that when a bear leaves the area, it's going to experience some different uh, potential causes of mortality. And I wanted to kind of show the effects of, the, of what was going on in the recovery zone and how those bears responded to those uh, local effects through mortality. Okay. And have genetic studies been done to look at the amount of genetic diversity in those, re in those augmented populations? And, and so uh, obviously we're doing some of the, the parentage, but to take a deeper dive into things, I think, you know, I, I know we've got some issues just strictly from the male effect of a single bear that has done a lot of the reproduction there. We actually have a graduate student that is starting some work uh, on a genetic study at both the Selkirks and the Cabinet Yak. And some of the uh, goals of that program uh, will be to look at uh, some of the genetics of cabinet populations as well as effective population size in both the Selkirk and the cabinet yak population at large. One thing that I did not mention that I, I wanted to, maybe here's an opportunity. I mentioned that the cabinet population was around 25 to 30 bears. There are another 25 to 30 bears, at least in the yak. We are seeing interchange with populations from the yak northward into BC. And so the entire population for the cabinet yak is possibly in the range of 55 to 60 bears. Okay, great, thank you. Um, here's a question, another question for you, uh, Wayne. Did you gather data from bears that were recaptured and returned in relation to body condition or health parameters? If so, did you see a difference from the original first capture to the re relocation? And we have not been successful at recapturing any of those bears uh, that did return. And so I don't have that sort of information. We do body conditions, uh, bioelectrical impedance measurements on bears that we capture within the recovery zone. And uh, we are seeing bears in good health that are there. And the ones that we have captured uh, here are all showing uh, reasonable body fat measurements, depending upon the time of the year that are in line with uh, measurements from other areas. Now, that's probably about all I can really say about that in a quantitative way, but if there's something I missed, uh, let me know. Okay, good, thank you. Um, here's a question for Hillary. Would delisting help get funds or implement actions for conflict mitigation, or is that a separate process? Um, yeah, or, or is that a separate process? I would say it is a separate process. Um, however, well, you know, for listed species, we do have funding for recovery efforts and we fund, um, most of the agencies who are involved, the states, USGS, to do management and monitoring, including conflict prevention. Um, but there are pro probably there's more money outside of the Fish and Wildlife Service for those efforts. And there's a, a, a ton of NGOs, non-governmental organizations who are doing preventative projects, state agencies, Forest Service, all of the agencies are putting significant funding. So yeah, there's some of it that comes with ESA listing, but there's a lot more probably outside of ESA listing. And I, and I don't think um, it's really it's really not tied. OK, great. Um, I, here's a question I suppose for anyone. Do you have any plan to secure bear migration corridors between the NCD and the GYS uh, ecosystem? Anyone? Yeah, 
any plans for to to uh, conserve the uh, immigration uh, connectivity corridors? Yeah, I, I think um, there are a number of entities that are looking at uh, some of the work that, that we did together with uh, with our interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team and, and Cecily's team uh, when we when developed those uh, step selection models and uh, potential connectivity area, zones of connectivity. And, and there's a number of, of NGOs that have expressed interest in, in that information. Um, and I, I think some certainly uh, it's being being considered and being used uh, to secure connectivity areas. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, here's a question for Wayne. Do Montana residents seem to value the augmented grizzlies differently than native grizzlies? Do they tend to blame the state for conflicts there more strongly than conflicts in other areas where bears occur naturally? Um, interesting question. Um, I do not believe that they, there's any difference there, uh, largely because of the low number of conflicts in this recovery area, given the size of the population. Um, we have a bear management specialist that resides here in Libby that covers the cabinet yak. And we just have a relatively low number of conflicts. And a lot of the conflicts that uh, the bear management uh, specialist responds to, that would be Kim Annis, um, turn out to be black bear related issues rather than grizzly bear issues. And in terms of actually having to either lethally remove a grizzly bear or relocate a grizzly bear, um, you know, those events are, are oftentimes maybe for relocations, maybe one a year. And for elimination of grizzly bears, we've only done a couple in the last 30 years. And so uh, conflicts remain, at least associated with grizzly bears, remain at a pretty low level here. And I think it's low enough that it is difficult possibly for the public to uh, maybe develop a difference or, or recognize a difference between uh, bears that were placed here as part of the augmentation program and naturally occurring bears. And if you saw on the, uh, on the family tree, um, certainly bears that were, were born here vastly outnumber the numbers of bears that we have actually placed here that might remain here today. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, here's another vote, uh, another question for you, Wayne. You mentioned cross-fostering. Uh, what were the reasons for it being shut down? Cross fostering between black bears and grizzlies, I'm sure. So, cross fostering, uh, again, just to quickly describe it, we would take uh, zoo born grizzly bears and place them in the natal dens of black bears, remove her cubs. Of course, the black bears would be radio collared as well. We would do so in the winter period and replace her cubs with zoo born grizzly bears. Um, the technique uh, was at least proposed. Remember, we're talking about something that occurred almost uh, 25 to 30 years ago. The science on that was uh, not particularly well developed. And a lot of the local residents basically felt that they were having a number of conflict issues with black bears uh, around ranches, homes, that sort of thing. And there was at least a perception that the next time they had a conflict with a black bear, it might be accompanied by a grizzly bear. And at least that was kind of some of the things that we heard, the controversial nature of it, the complexity of doing the work with securing a zoo born bears, moving them into a den, all of these things contributed to uh, the removal of that option from the uh, augmentation plan. Cool. Um, I kind of had a question just about the whole, to, to anyone, uh, about the, you know, gr the grizzly bear recovery. You know, we've been working uh, for many, many years now on recovery and, and delisting of the grizzly. And if, you know, the court challenges to that have been successful on a couple of occasions. And if... Um, authorities decide to abandon the delisting process. I assume that's, a, that's an option. 
Um, if that's the case, what would happen to management and research on grizzlies uh, in, in those ecosystems? You know, would there be a de-emphasis, a de uh, no, you know, if, uh, if there's no like delisting goal to, to work toward? And that's for anybody. Well, I could try and answer that. Um, you know, I don't know that the Fish and Wildlife, uh, one of our jobs is to recover and delist. And the Endangered Species Act lays that out. And so um, I, I don't think we would ever say we're just abandoning delisting, maybe for a period if we wanted to say, one of the things we're, we've been asked to do by different organizations and other agencies is to revise a recovery plan. And so um, if we chose, you know, potentially we could choose to delay delisting, but I wouldn't think we'd ever come out and say we wouldn't delist. Um, if we delayed delisting, I think we would continue to do what we're doing right now. So most of the on the ground work, especially in terms of conflict, the management part of it is done by the state agencies and the tribes that have reservations uh, in grizzly bear range. And because bears are listed as a threatened species rather than endangered, uh, we have a, a 4D rule that gives us flexibility to actually manage bears, relocate, uh, euthanize bears for conflict reasons or for self-defense. And so that does provide some management tools. Um, there's people asking for more flexibility and you know, we're constantly dealing with that as we have more bears on private land, more you know, uh, livestock depredations, more conflicts. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Anybody have anything else? I can maybe quickly um, comment on the, on the research end of things. Uh, I think regardless of the, the legal status of the population or, or the ultimate goals, I think the, the commitment from uh, the partner agencies of the interagency grizzly bear study team will remain the same. I know the commitments from my agency, US Geological Survey, is there uh, regardless of, of uh, where, wherever the, the legal wrangling might be. So. Okay, and I think that's 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 part of that is the recognition that you know this some some would argue with this maybe, but um, you know the argument can be made that this is a conservation reliant species uh, overall. Yeah. Okay. Any other um, comments? Yeah, Wayne. Go ahead, Cecily. Okay, um, I would just say that um, we cannot avoid some jurisdictional conflicts when you start talking about state agencies and federal agencies working together to recover populations. And um, from the standpoint of the states, I think that there is sometimes a point of view that if we can't get the bears delisted, you know, maybe we should leave all of the um, conservation work to the federal government. Um, why should we continue to put um, so many efforts and resources toward a species that we don't have the, the capacity to actually have the jurisdiction to, to manage? And so unfortunately, over time, the, the, the lack of delisting when there are recovered populations can kind of intensify those sort of interagency um, conflicts. And so the, yeah, the one thing I might add here, at least uh, from the area where I work, Cabinet Yak and Selkirks, I work in recovery zones that are that do not have large protected areas in the form of wilderness or national parks. Many of these areas are located, or most of these areas are located on public use, uh, multiple use lands where there are other things going on on the public lands, like, uh, like mining, like timber harvest, like high levels of recreation, other sorts of things. And, and a fair amount of our funding, and I'm tying this back to the money, actually comes from the US Forest Service and other entities that uh, we function as providing not only monitoring recovery, but a lot of the information that we gather here helps support some of the programs that identify 
uh, how to implement these programs, what sort of mitigation measures need to be taken to protect grizzly bears uh, while having some degree of timber harvest, mining, other sorts of actions out there. And so I guess I still foresee uh, the support from the Forest Service coming in that regard, because many of these uh, uses on the public lands are certainly not going away and the need to monitor and mitigate and defend those actions. Okay, any other comments? We'll go back to the questions for Wayne Casworm. What happened to the black bear cubs who were removed from the den? So we, we did not remove any bears, obviously we dropped that, but the plan would have been to give them to another black bear female uh, another natal den. So uh, her litter of cubs might go from two to three or something like that, but that was part of the plan. Obviously, we did not implement that. Yeah, and then a follow-up question, Wayne. Um, you, re you recommended continued steady augmentation of the population. What are the criteria, criteria the population needs to meet for you to no longer recommend continued augmentation? So part of that would be based on our population goal. And I mentioned that we have approximately 55 to 60 bears. Um, we are, our population goal for the cabinet yak is approximately 100 bears. And we have a number of ways that we measure or monitor that through the recovery planning process. But uh, what we would like to see, I think, in order to uh, potentially either slow or bring the program to an end, was some natural movement and reproduction into and or out of the cabinets portion of this recovery zone. I mean, that's what eventually led us to the old augmentation effort in the first place is a lack of movement and reproduction from bears getting into and out of the cabinets. And once we begin to see some of that, I think we could start to uh, lessen uh, at least the uh, level of population augmentation. Uh, but again, we are adopting a slow and steady approach in the meantime in order to maintain the public support that we do have, and we are seeing progress. Okay. Um, here's another question for anyone. When educating the public about bears and conservation, what is something they can do to help? And I assume they mean meaning uh, the public. Anybody want to take that one? Um, I think primarily it's, um, you know, securing attractants if you live in grizzly bear habitat, trying to um, be, pay attention to the potential for conflict, um, being safe when you're recreating in grizzly bear country. Um, and then I think it's probably important for the agencies to um, be sure that the public understands that the populations are expanding and that um, people might encounter grizzly bears in places that they wouldn't have 10 years ago and much of Western Montana and um, uh, much of uh, Western Wyoming and Eastern Idaho. Um, our potential grizzly bear habitat and people could encounter a bear there. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Um, what are the, what were the roles of the NGOs in uh, contributing to the success of the, of the recovery, this recovery effort for so many of these populations? Does anyone, anyone want to talk about NGOs? White? So uh, we have a, actually a fairly active NGO program here that uh, is supporting um, a variety of things from the standpoint of land protection. Uh, Vital Ground is one entity, y to y that has helped secure a few easements in the local area uh, to uh, improve habitat connections, both within the Cabinet Yak as well as off to other areas. Um, we've also had contributions from several groups towards um, some of the sanitation efforts. Uh, one of the things that we did here was to um, put uh, electric fencing around a number of the county 
uh, transfer stations for garbage. And we had a lot of contributions from NGOs towards that effort in terms of erecting fences, consolidating sites, uh, electrification of those. Uh, anyway, a variety of different things. And I would uh, you know, like to thank the environmental community for at least some of those sorts of contributions. Yeah. Any other yeah, comments on NGOs? Uh, Hillary? Yeah, I just wanted to add on, um, Wayne's right, There's a, there are a ton of NGOs that are doing great things for grizzly bears. Defenders of Wildlife has a cost share program for electric fencing. People in Carnivores is, um, works on grizzly bear conflict issues, like doing big creative problems and fundraising themselves and also doing the work on the ground. Um, GYC, there's a ton of them. I, and a lot of groups are also doing um, bear education. Um, so I know I'm gonna miss a whole bunch, <laughs> but um, yeah, we wanna thank those. Also landowners are, uh, there's a lot of landowners who are going to great lengths to make sure that they um, can coexist with bears, you know, funding their own fences. There's, we work with some really good ranch communities. The Blackfoot Challenge is one of them. Um, it's kind of a well-known, I guess a grassroots community effort to um, live and ranch in grizzly habitat. And so, yeah, I just wanna say thanks. There's a lot of people doing good things for bears. Yeah, good. You know, and, and that expands to more than just the NGO communities. Um, industry has also supported um, management of, of grizzly bears and recovery of grizzly bears here. The, uh, the bear management specialist that we have in the cabinet yak was at least initially funded by a mining company. Now that position is now part of Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks base funding. But a uh, mining company, uh, Hecla, uh, was involved with uh, funding that program for the first several years. And so there are opportunities, not only with NGOs, but with industry to help support recovery efforts. Okay. One last thing I, I'd probably mention on that is um, a lot of the watershed groups, which is primarily made up of um, agricultural interests within different areas of the state, they also work together to try to remove carcasses. They have carcass remo removal programs and work with each other to um, keep people alerted when bears are active in their area. Um, and they may not be um, organizations that are highly in favor of having bears around, but they recognize that bears are there. And so they wanna do what they can to protect their interests and work together. So I think that's another, important part of this um, living with grizzly bears. Okay. I had a kind of a question. I was wondering, talking about the natural recolonization of the bitter roots, if that were to occur, would there be a possibility of reviving the, the reintroduction uh, effort down there and maybe call, calling it an augmentation, which apparently has been successful? that we've had better luck with, with calling them augmentations rather than reintroductions. Um, I, I would say probably not, <laughs> but I just may have different opinions. I, I don't think the service would ever do a reintroduction effort there. I mean, we do have bears very close. Augmentation, um, I'm not sure either. It's a real political touchy area. <laughs> and it might be better for bears actually if they get there on their own. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Cecily, what do you think about that? Or Wayne or others? Um, I think that right now, obviously, there's probably very little support for that. Um, I think that if we could actually succeed in getting the recovered populations delisted. And it was um, suggested that a reintroduction would hasten the delisting, for example, of the Bitterroot ecosystem, then perhaps. But without a history of successfully delisting any populations, I doubt there's going to be any support for that. 
Couple you know, other. one one quick thing to add on, Joe, just uh, sure. so others know, for a reintroduction of if you're, we are a listed species, which we are. If the service were to reintroduce, um, you cannot have a population. Well, to get additional management flexibility as part of that, you cannot have an existing population which would be two or more breeding females. And so that is limiting. If we were to reintroduce one of the carrots for the people that live there would be, hey, we can offer additional management flexibility. And so if there were bears, even just two breeding females, you know, within a certain area, um, we would not be able to get that additional flexibility. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so here's another question for you, Hillary, that was submitted. Uh, what is the main source of conflict with bears? And do you believe that they are more perceived or real? And uh, are you combining the social data with ecological data? And if so, how are you doing it? That's a big question. Yeah, um, I, can that. I can break that. I guess the first part was, uh, uh, do you think the conflicts are more real than perceived? More real than per We have a lot of conflicts. <laughs> we have a lot, um, yeah. especially you saw that um, slide from Frank where as we get farther away from the recovery zone, we have more conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, they are real. They're real. Uh, the, and the primary types of conflicts are um, or conflicts or mortalities. Livestock depredations are a big one. Um, we have site, what we call site conflicts. So those would be chickens, a bear on the porch for dog food, uh, bird seed. Um, think about the map. Um, Rick showed a really, a few good maps of the distribution overlapping the Flathead Valley where Kalispell is. And we have uh, grizzly bears. Um, their distribution on private land is rapidly expanding. Um, not conflicts, but we also have increasing numbers of vehicle collisions, train collisions, a lot of illegal mortalities. Cecily, I maybe. No, Frank. Can I, yeah, I just wanted to respond to the, because the question was also about crossing ecological and, and socioeconomic data. Um, and I might want to mention an effort, a PhD student recently at the University of Wyoming by the name of Aaron Enriquez and his major professor, David Finoff, published a paper that used a bioeconomics model and they really connected um, an ecological component in that model with um, benefits and damages of bears in, in both, uh, you know, in terms of non-use value, uh, consumptive values, and they looked at reactive versus uh, active management uh, scenarios. And, and they, they kind of looked at it from an from economic standpoint, which I thought was really, for me, was kind of eye-opening. Um, so I might want to point to that work. So people are, are working on trying to connect um, the ecology of bears, the population growth, et cetera, numbers um, with uh, actual socioeconomic data that, uh, that I think could pr provide some future perspectives uh, for, for these conservation efforts to move forward, especially for a place like Yellowstone and Northern Continental Divide. Okay, good. Question for Hillary, if the recovery criteria were met in the uh, Northern Continental Divide and greater Yellowstone ecosystem, how were the legal challenges successful? That's a good question. Um, so delisting is much more than meeting the recovery criteria. It's, so there's that biological component that you have to say, yes, we're there. But it also includes looking into the foreseeable future. That's a word in the Endangered Species Act and making sure threats over the foreseeable future will not cause a population to drop below recovery levels. So things like making sure we've got habitat um, regulations in place that you know, continue to provide that secure core habitat. Um, and there's many, many things like that, looking at disease, looking at um, mortality levels. So do we have uh, a, a sufficient regulatory mechanism that will make sure human cause mortality or 
or total mortality does not rise to a level where the, it's going to cause the population to drop below recovered levels. Uh, climate change, you know, looking at fires, there's all sorts of potential threats that we analyze and look out to the foreseeable future. And we have to demonstrate that these are not going to be a problem in the future. So it's a, it's, it, it is a, a, a much uh, more in-depth analysis to successfully delist a population. And then put on top of that, we have policies, our distinct population segment <laughs> policy, for example, is one thing that has hindered us in delisting. And so um, policies, you know, um, the Administrative Protect or Procedures Act, we have to proceed in a specific manner. If we don't, it's always challengeable. And we're challenged um, on many, many things. <laughs> yeah, and if I remember correctly, only about 2% of all the listed species are delisted due to recovery. So it's a pretty high bar. It is. Uh, that's really about all the questions that we have, uh, that we've had submitted. Um, any, uh, anyone else uh, wish to make any other comments before we adjourn this session? Again, I'd like to thank my co-moderator, uh, Lori Roberts, for keeping us on track and making sure all the, all the electronics and whatnot have worked. And I think they did work pretty well. And so um, at this time, we'll uh, adjourn the meeting and there are other things coming up later on in the conference uh, beyond that.